the island of Gaunt, a single mountain that lifts its peak a mile above the storm-wracked northeast sea, is a land famous for wizards. From the towns in its high valleys and the ports in its dark, narrow bays, many a Gauntishman has gone forth to serve the lords of the archipelago in their cities as wizard or mage, or looking for adventure to wander, working magic from isle to isle of all Earthsea. Of these, some say the greatest, and surely the greatest, voyager was the man called Sparrowhawk, who, in his day, became both Dragonlord and Archmage. His life is told of in the deed of Ged and in many songs, but this is a tale of the time before his fame, before the songs were made. In the opening lines of A Wizard of Earthsea, the first installment of Ursula K. Le Guin's Earth's Sea Cycle, we are shown the tale of a hero before they were a hero, of a great and powerful mage who once, like all men, was nothing more than a boy. Ged, or as he was called in his youth, Dooney, was born no one special. Nothing from his begetting marked him as being far more extraordinary than his fellows. But a hero is forged, not born. And in the hour of their testing, a hero is shaped in the face of their suffering. Ged comes face to face with many adversaries over the course of his journey. He tamed an ancient and fearsome dragon. He fended off the temptations of power from old spirits bound in stone, and he mastered the words of power written on ink and bound in tomes. And yet, none of them stood as his greatest enemy. No, the greatest adversary of them all was the one he could never escape, never truly run from, and that was himself. Before we delve into our discussion on the shadow archetype, I think it's important to introduce the one, the only, Carl Jung, and, of course, some background on the concept of individuation. So, without further ado, let us begin our deep dive into the murky depths of the shadow. Carl Gustav Jung, born July 26, 1875, was a Swiss psychiatrist who would, in time, become the founding father of a branch of psychology known as analytical psychology. In modernity, it is more commonly referred to as Jungian psychology. Jung developed analytical psychology as a means of differentiating his own theories from that of Sigmund Freud's. You see, the two of them were once colleagues, and furthermore, friends, who spent about seven years working together. However, due to differences in opinion, this mainly stemmed from their opposing ideas on the nature of the unconscious mind. Their collaboration came to an end. Regardless of this, Jung's ideas on the unconscious persevered even into the modern day. His ideas have influenced popular reconstructions of psychology, especially those constructed around personality psychology. These concepts include the term introversion and extroversion, his elaborations on the conscious and the unconscious mind, and, of course, his work on archetypes. I use the term individuation to denote the process by which a person becomes a psychological individual, that is, a separate, indivisible unity or whole. So, what is individuation? Well, individuation is a process of self-realization where a person comes into their individual identity that brings them into a state of psychological wholeness. This is done through the union of opposites, the assimilation of split aspects of the unconscious, the part of our psyche that is essentially unknown with those of the conscious. From this and this alone can an individual's psyche be whole. Out of this union emerges new situations and new conscious attitudes. 
I have therefore called the union of opposites the transcendent function. Carl Jung further developed Freud's concept of the unconscious. While he agreed that the unconscious assisted in the emergence of the personality, he thought that the unconscious was divided into two layers, the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious, which contains the biological components of a personality that is inherent at birth, or the portions of our genetic memory that is inherited from our ancestors. We make the great mistake of thinking that children are born a tabula rasa, but that is not the case. They are born with vast inherited memory, which contains a subjective content to meet everything which they contact externally. Jung's concept of archetypes, he believed, were derived from the collective unconscious. The four major archetypes include the persona, the anima, the animus, and the shadow. There is no set limiter on the amount of archetypes that can exist. Some others that exist, which I'm sure you will recognize, include the child, the mother, the trickster, the sage slash wise old man slash cynic, essentially Gandalf, and so on and so forth. Archetypes generally work in conjunction to form the entirety of the personality, though in their expression, most people tend to favor one archetype over the other. However, it is to one of these archetypes, and one of them alone, that we will turn our attention, an archetype that plays a major role in the events of A Wizard of Earthsea. And if you are familiar with the source material, you may have already guessed which one it is. We are going to be talking about the archetype of the shadow. Great power in you, Sparrowhawk, and you utterly misused it. You tried to summon a spirit of the dead, and instead you brought out the most fearsome being our world has ever known. I saw it as a shadow. The shadow of your ignorance. The shadow of your arrogance. The shadow personifies everything that the subject refuses to acknowledge about himself, and yet is always thrusting itself upon him directly or indirectly. For instance, inferior traits of character and other incompatible tendencies. The shadow plays an integral role in the process of individuation. Individuation would cease to begin if the shadow is bypassed, ignored, Unless the shadow is accepted, then no form of development can commence. As Carl Jung says, it is the encounter with the shadow that is the apprentice piece in the individual's development. The confrontation with the shadow is the first step of courage on the inner way, a test sufficient to frighten off most people, for the meeting with ourselves belongs to the more unpleasant things that can be avoided, so long as we project everything negative into the environment. The early years of a child's development, their experiences, relationships, and the environments that they are exposed to are critical to the formation of their personality and the way they learn to interpret the world around them. Nowadays, we also know that experiences in early childhood can impact biological development as well. This includes gene expression, mental health, and physical development. So, in order to accurately chart the course of a character's development, we need to go back to their beginnings. Ged, from a young age, had quite the aptitude for magic. He was a natural mageborn, manifesting his powers as early as the age of seven. He was born to the village of ten alders on the island of Gaunt, the youngest of seven sons. Yes, indeed, he was a seventh son, of whom, being far older than he, had already left the village to work their trades, either on farms or smiths or sailing the vast open seas. His mother died when he was young, and his father wasn't really the fatherly type. Even his aunt, his dead mother's sister, didn't pay much attention to him. Once she finished caring for him as a baby, she went back to her own business and thought nothing of him. 
As a consequence, he was devoid of a parental figure. He grew up without anyone teaching him any form of early moral development. As such, he grew wild, a thriving weed, a tall, quick boy, loud and proud and full of temper. Once he could look after himself, he was essentially left to his own devices, alone and ignored. It wasn't until he displayed a propensity for magic that anyone began to see him as being worthy of anything. His aunt, who also happened to be a witch, took him under her tutelage and taught him everything she was willing to teach. So, what's the spell to be today? Is it the one creating ice? Should I sit? I'm gonna sit. Which wasn't really all that much. Unfortunately, in the world of Earthsea, at least in the first three books, magic and magery is a boys-only, no-girls-allowed sort of thing. There is a saying on Gaunt, weak as a woman's magic, and there is another saying, wicked as a woman's magic. The first time Ged was given any sort of praise or attention was because of his magic. So, it is really no surprise that, from a young age, Ged's sense of worth became tied up in and synonymous with his ability to use magic. This, in turn, sparked his fascination with magic, and as such, he greatly desired magical knowledge, for he hungered to learn, to gain power. Eventually, his wish was granted. The mage of Ray Albi, Ogion the Silent, upon hearing of his feats of magic, came to the village to give the boy his true name. In Earthsea, names are a thing of power. Know you not that every living thing has a secret name in which his power resides? Everyone had one, even dragons, and should anyone discover your true name, they held power over you. And if Dunis, as he was called in his youth, father was permissing, then Ogion would take the boy with him as apprentice and school him in his gifts. On the day the ceremony of passage was held, Duni relinquished his child use name, and Ogion, waiting as was promised, gave him his true name, and his true name was Ged. Ged had thought that as the apprentice of a great mage, he would enter at once into the mystery and mastery of power. He would understand the language of beasts and the speech of the leaves of the forest. He thought, and sway the winds with his words, and learn to change himself into any shape he wished. Maybe he and his master would run together as stags, or fly to Ray Alby over the mountain on the wings of the eagles. Ged, of course, was wrong. His master's teaching philosophy was frustrating, to say the least, for it went against everything that he had been expecting. Ogion the Silent found meaning in, well, silence. His methods were all about patience and understanding, especially understanding the way of all things. In order to learn its true name, you first had to know its being, which, to Ogion, was more important than its use. What, after all, is the use of you, or of myself? Is Scott Mountain useful, or the open sea? Try as he might, Ged didn't find what he was looking for, and that was knowledge, for knowledge was the key to power. Over time, he began to think of his apprenticeship with Ogion as being pointless, utterly futile. He thought he might learn more from any common man than this supposed great mage. Well, frankly, Magus, since I've been with you, I don't feel I've learned a thing. And here... Ged's impatience and misunderstanding of Ogion's teaching methods is projected into his thoughts as skepticism over his master's supposedly renowned abilities. One day, while he was gathering herbs for Ogion, he ran across a strange girl, a girl he knew by sight as the daughter of the old lord of Ray Albi. She recognizes him as well and approaches him, wishing to hear his tales of sorcery. And, as they talked, she was quite obviously impressed by him, but she offered him no praise. He had a strange desire to please her, to win her admiration. And so, he decided to boast about his own capabilities, even though he was only a mage's adept. 
Surette, as we later know the girl's name to be, eventually goads him into working a changing spell. At first, he refuses, but then she strikes him where he's most vulnerable, injuring his pride. Are you afraid to do it? No, I'm not afraid. She smiled a little disdainfully and said, Maybe you're still too young. That he would not endure. He did not say much, but he resolved that he would prove himself to her. His reactivity here is at an all-time high. You'll notice that when Ged is, essentially, triggered, he tends to lash out, often in a negative and illogical manner. In these instances, the unconscious supersedes the conscious mind. As Carl Jung says, Consciousness succumbs all too easily to unconscious influences, and these are often truer and wiser than our conscious thinking. So he goes back to Ogian's hut and looks through his lore books, one of which contains the spells for self-transformation. And this is when Ged has his first encounter with the Shadow. After this, Ged is presented with a choice. Ogian, who is well aware of his student's disillusionment, tells Ged of Roke Island. On Roke Island lies a school for wizards. No, not that school. A place of immutable power, home to the Archmage of Earthsea, where, to the young, they teach all the high magical arts. You must make the choice yourself. Rogue Island of Ojin. Then Rogue it must be. Upon entering the school at Rogue No, one of the first characters that greets Ged is a tall youth named Jasper. Jasper arrives in the narrative as a catalyst for the events of the novel. Ged and Jasper are quite similar, two sides of the same coin. Though they hail from very different backgrounds. Ged from a poor family, Jasper from a rich one. You have the honor of addressing Jasper of Eolg, of the House of Havnor. Both of them care for the respect and prestige that comes with power. They are both powerful, magical adepts, well ahead of others in their class and, as such, are looked up to and seen as leaders amongst their peers and, most importantly, are incredibly prideful and see themselves as separate and above the rest. To Ged, Jasper represents everything that he wants to become, a powerful magic user, someone who is seen and praised by others, and, most of all, a respected sorcerer. And, because of that, Ged's admiration of him, though he would never willingly admit that, turns into a dark, twisted form of envy. Ged, of course, is not aware of this. From the moment they first meet, Ged has quite a few misgivings about Jasper. Whether this be because of inherent prejudices due to classism, and note, this is not as a projective form of insecurity on Ged's part. He doesn't seem to be bothered by his low economic status. But rather, this may come about as his own perspective of how a person from a wealthy class might act or even view him. The answer remains unknown. We, as the audience, remain locked outside of Jasper's mind. We only know that Ged perceives Jasper as looking down on him. We don't know if he really does or not. The reader, along with Ged, is not privy to that information. But this projection, and as a consequence, the resulting interaction, sparks the beginning of a feud. Ged's hatred of Jasper, besides being convenient to the plot as it is, what encourages Ged to make a whole slew of stupid decisions are really his own qualities reflected back to him. Though our conscious mind may reject our shadow selves, these aspects must be processed. They can't simply be forgotten or ignored. 
So the shadow begins to transpose itself onto other people so that we are literally forced to come face to face with these repressed slash rejected aspects of ourselves. If you hate a person, you hate something in him that is part of yourself. What isn't part of ourselves doesn't disturb us. These behaviors, which are situated in his shadow, drive him to act in an illogical manner. When we aren't cognizant of our negative, and I am using the word negative loosely, a better, more accurate word would be destructive. These unconscious programs that most people tend to let run not only their lives, but themselves. There is some truth to the Buddhist saying, the untrained mind is like a wild horse. We have these unconscious forces that drive everything that we do. The thought we shall think, the deed we shall do, even the fate we shall lament tomorrow, all lie unconscious in our today. There is nothing inherently wrong with this. This is actually quite natural. As the brain uses a lot of energy on a day-to-day -day basis, our minds often fall into this drifter-type state, or autopilot mode, as a means of conserving energy. And this is great, unless these unconscious faculties are in some way compromised. Throughout life, we retain a certain series of programming, thoughts, behaviors, reactions that manifest themselves as defense mechanisms. It is similar in a way to machine learning. Machine learning, if you aren't familiar with the term, is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience and by the use of data. Machine learning algorithms build a model based on sample data, known as training data, in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to do so. The brain works in the same way. It uses past experiences as a means to measure and, in turn, predict the outcomes of current and or future events. As you can see, this can be quite encumbering. This is the way in which one becomes imprisoned by their own mind. Geds need to be in the spotlight and the desire for praise, essentially external validation, all stems from his childhood wounding. He seeks that attention from others to make up for the lack of attention and tenderness that he did not receive in his youth. He is a prisoner to his own pride, his own quest for praise and power. This is what leads him to the hill on Roque Knoll that fateful night, and it is by his will and his will alone that loosens the shadow. Ged is left with a reminder, a token, as you will, from his encounter with the shadow, a set of deep, ragged wounds on his face that will never fully heal. He is left scarred and terribly afraid. That night, on the hill at Roknoll, he learned a great lesson, a necessary lesson that came at a terrible price. Now, when faced with the thought of leaving Roknoll and the protections that it offers, he is daunted, uncertain of his fate. His future is darkened, obscured by the shadow which haunts him. He cannot outrun it. Either he must face it or die, or perhaps face a fate worse than death itself. Ged had learned the hard way, the price that comes with great power the burden that it creates on the wizard, and the danger that irrevocably follows them throughout the course of their lives. Have you never thought how danger must surround power as shadow does light? Sorcery isn't a game we play for pleasure, for praise, lad. Every word, every act of our art is done for good or for evil before you speak or do. You must know the consequences. A wizard can't do as he pleases, not without disturbing the natural laws that govern magic, something called the balance. As our lovely Uncle Ben most famously says, With great power comes great responsibility. And so, Ged parts from Roknoll, 
a little worn for the wear, and far more humble than he began. Ged no longer desires the things he once wanted. Since the night on Roknol, his desire had turned as much against fame and display as once it had been set on them. As he flees the shadow, he does so from a space of fear. His doubts are no longer a deep-seated thing, an aspect of himself hidden in the unconscious. His encounter with the shadow has really brought them into the light. He doubts himself more now than ever before. He doesn't believe that he has the capability or strength to face his own shadow. And so, given this, he flees. The ego was born out of it, into consciousness, and turns its back on the unconscious, seeking to shut it out as much as possible. Here begins the tale of Ged's testing. Several times over the course of the journey, he is faced with temptation, those dark things in the world that wish to drag him back into his own darkness. By appealing to the desires of his younger self, the shadow drives him into situations that would foil him through his own foibles. The dragon of Pendor thought to sway him by giving him the one thing that would give him ultimate power over the shadow, its true name. But Ged did not face the dragon for that reason, and to have Conceded would have meant falling back into his old way of being. To Ged, only one thing was sure, that though the dragon might well be speaking the truth, though he might indeed be able to tell Ged the nature and the name of the shadow thing, and so give him power over it, even so, even if he spoke the truth, he did so wholly for his own ends. In Oskil and the court of Tyrannon, Ged is offered another token of power, the Stone of Tyrannon, which also has a dark spirit bound to it which seeks to corrupt Ged and use his magic for its own means, but that's another tale for another time. Both times, Ged wisely refuses. At each turn, the shadow seems to be two steps ahead, sending him nearly all the way into death. Ged eventually is driven back to the place where his story began, to a small hut in the forests of Ray Albi and to the hearth of his old master, Ogion the Silent. And it is Ogion that gives him the ultimate revelation. Ged's silence demanded truth, and Ogion said at last, You must turn around. Turn around? Yes. If you keep running, the evil would drive you. Choosing the way you go, you must do the choosing. You must seek what seeks you. And have it devour me when we meet? So that I am its creature and my powers are a danger to all no. of us? No. You must make this gabbit your horn. If you are a fugitive when it finds you, if you have used your strength in fleeing, it will prevail. But if you are doing the seeking, I'll be able to destroy it. I can't tell, but it's the best counsel I can give you. If you want to cease being hunted, you must become the hunter. As long as we run from our shadow self, it will continue to have power over us. For in knowledge is power, and if we know ourselves, the darkness and the light, and all the shades of grey in between, then we have a better chance at observing our repressed nature, and then, in turn, naming those patterns. It is only when we face the shadow, when the hunted becomes the hunter, that the shadow no longer has any hold on us. In the cold dawn, when Ogion woke, Ged was gone. Only he had left, in wizardly fashion, a message of silver-scrawled runes on the hearthstone that faded even as Ogion read them. Master, I go hunting. This is where the tables turn. Ged, the boy who crossed oceans to flee his shadow, a darkness of his own making, remembers his power. And in remembering his power, he is granted the boon of true confidence. Not the youthful pride that masked an unconscious insecurity. Once Ged comes to the realization that he will never escape his shadow, he makes an important decision that he will face his shadow once and for for all. Here, the shadow is consciously being realized for the first time. That which was trapped, repressed in the unconscious mind is at long last becoming conscious. And here, 
when the existence of the shadow is being consciously recognized does it begin to take on form. And it may be that in his summoning of it, allowed in the light of day, had given it, or forced upon it, some form and semblance. Certainly it had some likeness to a man, though being shadow, it cast no shadow. In fact, the shadow began to look like him. Here, when Ged encounters Vetch once again, and Vetch is an old friend from his school at Roknol on the island of Ishmael, his friend recounts a sighting he had of a mysterious, shadowy figure. Three days ago, in the streets of Kor, the village up there in the hills, I saw you. That is, I saw a presentment of you. Or an imitation of you. Or maybe simply a man who looks like you. And so Ged, along with his old friend Vetch, steer Lukfar out into the farther lands and to the sea that dwells beyond them, and set out, once and for all, to confront the shadow. They travel, all day and all night, driven eastward by powerful mage winds, until they seemingly get lost, drifting listlessly out into the open sea. Then, eventually, they come to a part of the open sea that mimicked land. Though Vetch could not see that dark slopes beneath unmoving stars, yet he began to see with his wizard's eye a darkness that welled up in the hollows of the waves all around the boat, and he saw the billows grow low and sluggish as they were choked with sand. In this unreal land, directionless, lifeless, with only darkness and stars, do Ged and the Shadow finally meet. They come face to face, and, in that moment, Ged does not seek to destroy it. Instead, he names it. He gives it the name of Ged, as it is his shadow, a part of his truest self. Though, for the longest time, he consciously didn't acknowledge that. Ged reached out his hands, dropping his staff and took hold of his shadow, of the black self that reached out to him. Light and darkness met and joined, and were one. The two of them merge and become one, for that was what they were, two halves of a whole in conflict with one another. The game of hunter and hunted, predator and prey, comes to a close. The battle was neither won nor lost. Instead, in naming the shadow of his death with his own name, he had made himself whole, a man who, knowing his whole true self cannot be used or possessed by any other power other than himself, and whose life therefore is lived for life's sake and never in the service of ruin or pain or hatred or the dark. The wound is healed, he said. I am whole. I am free. Ursula K. Le Guin's depiction of the shadow does not fully align with Carl Jung's shadow archetype. The figure of the shadow itself, as presented in A Wizard of Earthsea, is rather one-dimensional. It is more singularly a force of pure evil rather than an archetypal representation of the hidden aspect of the unconscious mind. And this is why I tend to prefer Carl Jung's version of the shadow. The shadow archetype doesn't adhere to the common dichotomy of good versus evil. The shadow itself can be inherently neutral. It simply represents the aspect of ourselves which have been repressed, that we have been willfully blind to. And these aren't all negative qualities. Sure, the shadow can contain our more destructive, aggressive, primal tendencies that we do have to repress in order to adapt into the roles of modern-day society, but it can also include personality traits, inherent affinities which have been stimmied, either through judgment or condemnation, by those who have played a huge role in raising us. There is so much that can be uncovered in our shadow, hidden watery depths that we've yet to breach. Certainly, there are aspects of our personalities and pasts that we don't yet wish to face. But beyond that, there are powerful creative and ambitious forces that we tend to shy away from, because in order to find the light in the dark, we must wade through the dead waters of the unconscious. The merging with the shadow only marks the beginning of Ged's individuation journey. 
This is a process that continues throughout the course of our lifetime, and ultimately, it isn't fully realized until later in life. In fact, Carl Jung saw it predominantly as a development in the second half of life. In the first half, one is concerned with expanding the ego and adaptation to collective norms, such as building personal social status. The second half of life is concerned with coming to terms with death, finding meaning in living, and the unique part each one of us plays in the world. In truth, the final stages of individuation for Ged don't occur or aren't even explored until the events of the tombs of Atuan and later in Teyanu. If the encounter with the shadow is the apprentice piece in the individual's development, then that with the anima is the masterpiece.